Now, one of the hottest points in a healthcare debate is whether and how to save money near the end of life. False charges of so-called death panels aside, Congress and many other Americans are having difficult decisions and discussions about how much of our health care dollars to spend on the last few weeks of life. President Obama says we spend too much there, but obviously the moral and emotional conversations here are difficult. Now comes a study comparing the use of intensive care in the U.S. and the U.K. near the end of life, and it finds Britain spends much less and apparently without much different results. So let's talk now to Hannah Wunsch, a doctor in the Department of Anesthesiology at um, Columbia University. Uh, at, is that Columbia Presbyterian, New York Presbyterian Hospital? Yes, that's correct. Yes, and co-author of the report in the American Journal of Respiratory and Critical Care Medicine. Dr. Wunsch, thanks so much for coming on WNYC. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. What did you decide to study exactly and why? So we are interested in in the question, as you put it, of uh, intensive care at the end of life. And just to clarify at the start, people get a little confused sometimes. We're not talking about emergency rooms. We're talking specifically about intensive care units where the sickest patients in the hospital are being taken care of. And and as you mentioned, it's a very expensive uh, thing and something that people sort of jokingly refer to as the expensive scare unit in that it's also a scary, unpleasant place for people to be for both patients and families and something that if you feel it's going to help, you absolutely want. Uh, one of my co-authors, Derek Angus, the University of Pittsburgh, describes it um, as kind of tough love. Um, but if you're going to die, if, it's at the, if you're at the end of life, it's not something that people really want. Uh, and we know that from surveys both in England and the United States, that people don't even want to be dying in the hospital, let alone in the intensive care unit. So we are interested in this issue of how do we do it, how do other places do it, um, and kind of what do the patterns look like, and is there room to improve? And so reading from your results, some of the stats here comparing the United States and the U.K. are unbelievably uh, starkly different. Of all deaths, 50% occurred in hospitals in England and just 36% in the United States, and yet only 5% of all deaths in England involved intensive care versus 17% in the U.S. In other words, fewer people were dying in hospitals in the U.S. at all, but three times as many were dying in intensive care units. And that that represented 10% of hospital deaths in England versus 47% of hospital deaths in the United States taking place in intensive care uh, units. And uh, and I'll give our listeners one more. Greater intensive care use of the U.S. was most notable with older age, you found, among people who died who were 85 or older, Intensive care was used for um, 31% of medical deaths and 61% of surgical deaths in the U.S. versus 2% and 8% in England. Why so different? Right. They're pretty stark numbers. Uh, And there's a couple of things going on here. One is differences in availability of resources. So we know actually from some of our own prior work that we have literally six times as many ICU beds per capita as they do in England, um, which is a hard number to get your head around, but it just tells you the magnitude of the difference of resources available. So we we can put people in the intensive care unit uh, quite easily in comparison to a place like England. And then there's also differences in uh, both expectations expectations and also laws in the two countries with regard to who's making decisions um, around things like use of intensive care. And and we have uh, kind of two things in our culture. One is a more is better mentality that many people have. Um, And the other is a do everything mentality when it comes to medical care. And that's our default. Our default is to say if someone's not doing well, they automatically receive the maximum therapy we can offer. And listeners, we only have a few minutes for phone cause, but you can call in if you've ever faced a decision about intensive care near the end of a loved one's life. Did money ever enter your mind? Should it? 212-433-WNYC. And what was it like? And how should your experience, especially if your loved one died while in the intensive care unit, inform the health care policy debate if you think it should at all? 212-433-WNYC-433-WNYC. 9692. You talk about different values in the two countries. Do you think ethics are different in the UK or people come to different 
answers to the same ethical questions? Would they not have this inflamed debate over phony death panels <laughs> in the UK <laughs> if they were debating their health insurance system? Well, I think everyone's certainly concerned about that idea of not getting care that's appropriate. Um, and I think that's true anywhere in, in England and here. And so I think in that sense, we're all the same. Um, but I think what is different is um, uh, uh, and more of an attitude, and this is more anecdotal than anything, of a, a shared sense of a resource in, in England than we have here. Um, and, uh, and I think that the bigger thing even than the money issue is really just the idea of trying to give people what they want at, at the end of life and having those discussions ahead of time. Uh, and these data, I think, really show that we potentially have a lot of room to, to move in that direction, uh, regardless of the costs and savings that we might have along the way, that it really suggests that um, we need to get better as physicians at having those conversations early and asking people if they really want to end up in the intensive care unit, and that patients also have to get better about uh, having those discussions with family and uh, their own physicians and bringing up what they want uh, early on so that we can help people plan and give them the appropriate care. Difficult conversations Very to have difficult. in all cases, personally as well as politically. Absolutely. I think it's hard for patients, and, and it's hard for physicians. People who have long-term relationships with, with uh, patients find it hard to bring those issues up. And then, for, for example, I work in the ICU. Often the first time I meet a family is when they're already in the intensive care unit. It's very hard to approach a family you've never met before and start talking about these issues off the top of your head. Phil in Queens is calling to say, I think, when his brother died, intensive care gave him a few extra weeks of life. Phil, is that right? What happened specifically to me is my brother went into an AIDS-related brain cancer coma, and the doctor said you could either let him die or we can take you know, some very aggressive action. And my brother, in his health proxy, asked, I know this is very emotional, <laughs> be obviously. Kept alive. And to be honest, you know, I told the doctor, you know, I'll guarantee the money, blah, 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 let's do it. He came out of his coma for six or seven weeks, maybe eight weeks. He enjoyed a corned beef sandwich again. <laughs> it's all right. It's all right, Phil. I, and and I, we I, get I, it. But yeah. I also had other relatives where we where we did operations on elderly relatives, and they lived for a few more years, and we had a wonderful life together. Phil, thank you for your calls, I, as always. And I think the important thing there that's is That's the other uh, side of the coin. Absolutely, but that you are able to know your uh, brother's wishes, and that's really the most important thing, and that's why I think emphasizing this isn't about money but really about tailoring care to what people want which may sometimes be aggressive care, um, is absolutely appropriate and is nice that when you can give that to people.